Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hacking History. The WannaCry attack in 2017 was one of the world's worst cyber attacks we've seen. But how would you feel if I told you that the story goes much deeper than just a few nerdy computer hackers causing havoc, but deep into US national security and an act of cyber warfare from a hostile state? On the 12th of May 2017, one of the world's worst cyber attacks took place. The WannaCry attack made its way onto the internet, infecting over 200,000 computers within the first day. The impacts of this infection were devastating to say the least, shutting down hospitals, private businesses and government departments, resulting in total loss of data and access to computers. Once infected, computers would only be able to demand a $300 ransom and to be paid in Bitcoin to unlock their machine. Desperate victims would rush to pay the ransom in hopes to restore their access and files, a promise that was never fulfilled. But what made this attack so prevalent and successful? For this, we'll need to dig a little bit deeper and see what the WannaCry malware was actually made of. While all cyber attacks seem to some degree be quite impressive, the WannaCry attack was really something else. It was composed of multiple pieces of highly sophisticated malware, including a zero day exploit for Microsoft Windows called Eternal Blue. This would be how the attackers will gain access to victim systems, something that Microsoft didn't even know about. Then it had a backdoor which would allow attackers to stay connected to a victim while evading antivirus software. This was called Double Pulsar. It also included code to replicate and spread to other computers, just like the code Redworm. And lastly, the ransomware, which would lock a user out of their computer and encrypt all their files and demand a ransom payment. So all these may sound like fancy buzzwords and to some extent that's true, but these fancy buzzwords is what the developers named these tools. These folks went by the name of Equation Group and it's suspected that this group actually works for the NSA. So why was the NSA developing computer malware and targeting hospitals, schools and citizens? Well, while they did develop these tools, they did not launch the attack. It's suspected that the NSA were keeping these powerful tools as cyber weapons, as these would be an invaluable asset in the event of escalating political tensions against a foreign power. But despite how powerful these tools were, the NSA had some extremely lax security of their own. Sometime before April 2017, these tools were leaked from the NSA. Sources say that Harold T. Martin, a consultant for Booz Allen Hamilton, which were contracting to the NSA, was the man responsible. Harold would simply walk out the front door with storage devices without ever being checked. Authorities gained a warrant to search his home and car where they found 50 terabytes of leaked NSA data. He was later arrested and sentenced to nine years in jail as a result of willful retention of national defense information. Sometime after the NSA breach, Microsoft received a tip that these tools were leaked from the NSA. Microsoft were quick to respond and issued the infamously known security advisory MS17-010, along with a Windows update which would patch this critical vulnerability. In fact, due to the severity of this tip, Microsoft even patched outdated and end-of-life operating systems like Windows XP. One month later, on the 14th of April 2017, the leaked tools would surface on the internet. A group known as the Shadow Brokers released them for free via a tweet before formally disbanding. Having such powerful tools out in the web attracted hackers like sharks to blood. One of these groups who retrieved them would construct a sophisticated attack which used the NSA tools and some of their own code to carry out a large scale cyber attack on the world. This group was named Lazarus Group. This is another sophisticated group with ties to national defense agencies. But this group is not part of the US government. They're part of the government that belongs to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, otherwise known as North Korea. The group launched the attack on the 12th of May and would start infecting Windows system with the ransomware. The attack quickly gained the name of WannaCry. The attack was live and infections spreading rapidly, infecting everyday Windows users to large corporations. Among those worst hit from this attack were Nissan Motor Company, which had to temporarily halt manufacturing, FedEx, which caused massive disruption to their operations and perhaps the most serious would be the National Health Service or NHS in the UK. 
The attack of the NHS could easily have resulted in lives being lost. Some emergency departments had to close. Imaging and operating theatre equipment were also affected, as well as administrative systems. Despite all this though, there were no recorded deaths as a result of WannaCry. The attack would have continued to spread in the wild if the security community didn't step up. As this attack was taking place, ethical hackers, those who use their skills for good, took it upon themselves to see if they could mitigate the effects of the attack or kill it altogether. While many responded to the call, two researchers really stood out, Marcus Hutchins and Jamie Hankins. They started to analyze the attack and begin to reverse engineer the code to find that Lazarus had built in a kill switch into the attack, presumably so they could stop the spread if it got beyond their control. The kill switch was actually a website, and if that website was offline, the attack would be active. If the website was online, the attack would stop. Hutchins and Hankins were able to find the website by inspecting the source code, and they found this URL. So they tried to register a website at this URL, and to their surprise, the domain had not yet been taken. So they were quick to buy it and upload a web page, which actually stopped the attack. These two worked tirelessly for several days with barely any sleep and received very little recognition for their efforts. The damages would have been far greater if it weren't for these two talented individuals stepping up to the call. While Microsoft did release a security patch a month before the attack, those who ignored the update were vulnerable. The attack worked by targeting the server message bus of a Windows computer. It's typically used for file and print sharing on a local network. While this is not exposed to the internet by default, those who have configured it to do so or lacked basic firewalls were exposing themselves to the attack. By the 20th of December 2017, the USA, the UK and Australia formally accused North Korea for the WannaCry attack. The US Treasury stated that the payments received from the ransom would further fund the nuclear weapons research program of North Korea. Park Jin Hyuk, a 34-year-old North Korean, was marked as their prime suspect for the attack. And right now, he's still currently on the FBI's most wanted list for the events of WannaCry, as well as attacks on Sony Pictures, weapons company Lockheed Martin, and many more. It's expected that payments from the ransomware added up to about 140,000 US dollars. However, despite this relatively low ransom payment, the cost in damages were extreme. Sirens, a security company had estimated that the economic impact was worth about 4 billion US dollars, and this is only from the immediate damages and not factoring in lost productivity due to so many businesses voluntarily disconnecting from the internet during the attack. This video is really just scratching the surface on such a remarkable set of events, and there's certainly so much to cover. Despite everything involved, from the NSA to Microsoft to North Korea, I'm amazed at how contained the impact of this attack was. Cybercrime is evolving into more serious acts of espionage and warfare. The events of WannaCry really just expose this to the public eye. How do you feel about this transition? Be sure to let me know in the comments and leave it a like if you found it interesting. If you want to be kept up to date in the world of cybersecurity, be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for the next episode. Anyway, I've been Jason from JasonSec, thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.